extra body movements disguised into my body language. A lot of the times, I have no idea I'm even doing them. That's because I have a mild case of Tourette syndrome. People with this condition have uncontrollable muscle twitches or tics. They can be quite small or really obvious. So has this syndrome stopped me from doing what I love? Well, I'll let you be the judge of that. Now, a lot of you may have heard of Tourette syndrome and even know about the twitches and tics. However, what I want to know is what exactly is it in my body that causes these tics? Actually, I've got an appointment right now. So I'm at Neurosciences Queensland to meet up with Professor Peter Silburn, who is one of Australia's leading medical experts when it comes to Tourette syndrome. Ticks come through the brain, right, but my brain knows not a lot about the actual brain itself. Now, what's happening with the brain? What happens with Tourette's? Sure. This is our brain, and your brain's no different to many other people's, all right? What happens in Tourette's is this part of the brain fires off, like things happen in there, and it sends messages down here that aren't inhibited. So you might get an urge to do something, and you think, here it comes, it comes here, it gets fired off, and boom, down through the middle part, down the spinal cord, from the spinal cord to nerves, and nerves attach to muscles, and the muscle fires off. It's not being inhibited in these regions, and that's the problem with Tourette's, that come through at inappropriate times. They're kind of normal movements. Everyone sniffs every now and then and coughs. That's usual, in fact, that's very important to do that for some things. But in Tourette's, it just comes through. You can't pull it down. Sometimes I can have ticks that uh, will have like a six month gap. So yeah. I can do one six months ago and then all of a sudden I get the urge to do it again. Is this quite common? Can you just have like a cycle of different ticks? Absolutely. That's in fact what happens. You can have a flurry in one part of the body and then it'll ease off and might even go away for years and then it'll come back. And so we're still trying to work out why that is. Why does the brain do that? You have a bit of activity and it settles down. Mm. And it's fascinating. We think it's how the brain's connected from one part to the other. My case of Tourette's is quite mild. However, some people have quite a full-on case of Tourette's. Are there any kind of treatment that you do for Tourette's syndrome? Oh, Seamus, like most people with Tourette's, you are just like most people. You don't really need any treatment because it just wears off, if you like. It hangs around, but it doesn't become a problem as you get older. If you do, there are medications. Very rarely, some people at the really tough end of the spectrum need surgery. And what we do is we put electrodes in the brain, in the deep brain, and it's called deep brain stimulation. And these tiny little electrodes are about a millimetre, say, and we find the area in the brain that acts like the gate, where it comes down through the middle, and we kind of suppress it and we stimulate other areas so you can start to inhibit it and not even know you're inhibiting it. So you're restoring function in the brain. Because in Tourette's, the structures aren't broken. It's yeah. just you're modulating differently. Well, it's great to know that there are people like Professor Peter doing such amazing work for people with severe Tourette's. But he assured me there is still so much more to learn about the human brain. There's 100 billion neurons and 10 times them supporting them. The numbers are enormous. There's only seven billion of us on the planet. Wow. So working out how all these guys work in a coordinated fashion is why we need people doing good hardcore scientific research across multiple levels. That's how we learn about it, and that's the most important organ for humans. Welcome to another Scope in a Flash. I'm Ted Petrie, and like a cool breeze on a summer's day, <laughs> it's great to be with me. Well, in groundbreaking medical news, rats with spinal cord injuries and paralysis have been able to relearn how to walk. Researchers led by Gregor Cortine at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology have developed a therapy based on the brain's ability to rewire itself, something those science boffins called neural plasticity. The aim of the research was to re-stimulate the inactive neurons in the spinal cord. Normally a healthy nervous system is stimulated by certain chemicals the body produces. To recreate this, the researchers injected chemicals into the injured rats. A few minutes after the injections, the scientists electrically stimulated the rat's spinal cord to send electrical signals through the nerves to begin rebuilding the pathways. Then the rats were harnessed into a vest, which was part of a robotic assisted device to ensure the rats are walking on the 
their own. Chocolate was placed at the end of the platform to encourage the rats to walk towards it. And after two weeks of training, the rats took their first steps and continued to improve from there. The researchers found that the newly formed neural fibres avoided the original injury, allowing signals from the brain to reach the spine. Human clinical trials should start within the next two years. I'm Ted Petrie and I believe in miracles. <sighs> Ah, I've got a quick medical related question for you. If you need an ambulance in Australia in an emergency, what number do you call? Well, now if you said triple zero, well, very good. If you said 911, uh, no, that's large chunks of the Americas. Now if you said 112, well, good for you, smarty pants. 112 can be dialed anywhere in the world from a digital mobile phone with coverage and it will automatically divert to the emergency services for that country. It should work even if the phone is locked or it has no SIM card. Ah, now even without a mobile phone, 112 will still redirect to 000 in Australia. And in large parts of the world, well, 112 is actually the official number. Coming up on Scope, we go into a hyperbaric chamber to see what it is, how it works and why they get used in medicine. Stick around. Ah, hello again from Scope. Today we are probing the inner workings of medical science in much the same way a proctologist would probe. Actually, I'm not going to finish that analogy. That wasn't a good one to choose. So, a hyperbaric chamber. What's all that about? At first glance, this may look like a training room for astronauts, but this is actually a type of medical treatment. Hi, I'm Dr Ken, and I treat a lot of patients using this hyperbaric chamber. Hyperbaric chambers use change in pressure to help clear up a whole range of medical conditions, from slow healing wounds to diving injuries. The main unit we have here is a multi-place chamber which can treat up to eight patients at a time. To start with, patients are seated and fitted with a mask or helmet which pumps out pure oxygen. The chamber is then sealed and we increase the pressure inside to up to three times more than normal. It's hard to see the effect that this pressure has on the body, so I've brought along a few props to demonstrate. Inside this smaller chamber, I'm going to place some balloons, some ping pong balls, an egg on a bottle, and a bottle of soft drink. As we increase the pressure, the egg sinks into the bottle, the balloons shrink, and the ping pong balls will actually implode. This is because the pressure inside the ball, the bottle, and the balloon is less than the surrounding air pressure, causing them to collapse. Now the bottle of soft drink looks unchanged, but you have to open it under pressure to see the effect. You see, the dissolved gases in soft drinks are released when a bottle is opened at normal atmospheric pressure. But under the increased pressure in a hyperbaric chamber, the gases stay dissolved in the liquid and don't form into bubbles. Now you may be wondering how this machine helps us to treat medical problems. Well, the increase in pressure actually changes the way the gases are carried around in the blood. Oxygen usually travels around in our blood, connected to a molecule called haemoglobin. But when our blood is put under a lot of pressure, the oxygen can actually dissolve into the liquid part of our blood, which is called plasma. This allows the oxygen to travel more efficiently into damaged tissue to speed up healing. Hyperbaric chambers are also used to treat decompression illness, which is caused by gas bubbles forming in the blood of scuba divers. When divers dive deep underwater, their blood is put under a lot of pressure. And if they come back up to the surface too quickly, the quick decrease in pressure can cause nitrogen in the blood to turn into bubbles and can block vessels. When a person with decompression illness comes into the chamber, we can put them under high pressure to make the bubbles smaller and prevent them from blocking any blood vessels. While under pressure, 
the patient will also be given pure oxygen to breathe in, creating oxygen-rich, nitrogen-poor blood. This causes the nitrogen gas to dissolve back into the blood. We can then slowly return the chamber to atmospheric pressure without the nitrogen bubbles building up again. Unlike the blood in our body, the gases in the soft drink bottle aren't influenced by extra oxygen or any other blood chemistry. So when the pressure returns to normal, the fizz comes back. I've been thinking, and I suppose the aim of medical science is to keep us happy and healthy. And the images that medical science sort of conjures up, at least to me, will be hospitals and, and specialists and cutting edge research. Probably not though, computer games. We all know that to keep fit, you need to exercise. But besides exercising your body,